Today I'd like to introduce Oliver Sherman of Mount Venus Nurseries. If you've not been to Mount Venus Nurseries, it's in an old uh, wall garden, um, small wall garden. Um, it is one of the most beautiful garden nurseries you will ever see. It's up in the hills above Sandyford sort of area, not far from here. Um, they specialise in some rare and special plants and it's all about letting your garden um, grow with you. So your garden starts off um, young and it goes on to be mature and it goes and, and just like us, you know, we garden when we're fit to do lots and our garden should grow with us. Um, he's all about, you know, paths that don't um, dictate to the plants that grow near it, let the roots go um, and gardening so that uh, wildlife can, and, uh, can, can become a useful part of your gardening and your garden can be useful to wildlife. You're all very welcome here today and I hope you enjoy the talk. This is where the propagation all happens, in the, in the, most of it in the polytunnel. And obviously the polytunnel is not very big. Nur normally nurseries you see nowadays are about 15 polytunnels. But we want to, we grow plants that are hardy, that are exposed to, should be exposed immediately to the weather conditions and are initially good stock. And so all we need is a small polytunnel where things are then moved down to the first stock beds. These would be all small pots. In between the stock beds, uh, you see the, the mother stock beds. So we'd be planting out all our new plants, we'd be trialing them and seeing how they, uh, how they work, and then we'd be propagating from these. And then the larger plants, when they're potted on, they come into the top area of the nursery. There's shade uh, around the nursery. So within this nursery plot, which is quite systematically laid out. If you look at it in Google Earth, it looks like a computer chip. Uh, but we have lots of different habitats. More exposure, less exposure. Uh, those areas where the irrigation doesn't hit, those are very, obviously very dry and well off. Uh, the monarda. Monarda is the bergamot. And there's certain varieties of monarda which are incredibly drought resistant, produce fantastic seed heads, which are all scented. And you can imagine that going through this, you can carve your own paths going through it, like a kid going through a cornfield. And you end up with just patterns, landscapes, different levels of plants. It's not always about bringing the, the tallest plant at the back and the smallest one at the front, tearing something. If we do this, we're really following the idea of a, a two-dimensional picture. Instead of uh, bringing in a three-dimensional picture by bringing some of the more transparent plants up front. So you're looking through them, you're getting these views through the planting. They're framed by stalks and, and flowers. And you're looking at the flowers more as clouds instead of splashes of colour. That's important. And if you want to focus on a flower, you just focus your eyes towards it. So the prairie planting is obviously something we should be using a lot more for our roundabouts. And designing our roundabouts accordingly, bringing in that kind of, I mean, if they're mounded up like that, well, we can bring in all the rubble and the hardcore, we can use recycled materials, it doesn't really matter. And the thing is, only when we're planting these, we use the smallest plants available. So small plugs, or uh, uh, should I say nine centimeter pots. These will then find their own way through the gravel. Anyhow, Back to manure in your garden. Now this, this is uh, the root system of uh, various perennials, and some of them have an extensive root system if they're allowed to do so, if they have that kind of soil condition where they can root all the way down. And so, if you imagine the longest roots, now I don't know what plant it is, but we'll take that one, okay. And if we were to feed this area and put low, pack loads of manure in, what happened, that root, those root system, that root system would go, uh, horizontal instead of vertical. So, you're obviously going to have a void from there to there if those roots go horizontal. So, that's what we do with feeding. It's not great. I mean, certain gardens and certain ways of cultivating, if you're doing a lot of roses and dahlias and so on, then okay. But if you want to bring in a lot of diversity, then it's, it's about less feeding. Plants will eventually root down. We just have to have more patience. Could be that they look terrible for two or three years. 
But then, all of a sudden, they've made their way down. It's the same when we're planting woodland. Uh, woodland is very difficult to plant up, and the problem nowadays is that we nursery people were uh, forced to grow things in bigger and bigger pots for, to make people more and more, uh, should I say, uh, tempted to buy these big plants. But the problem is you're, you're buying a big pot of peat, which are trying to put into an unfavorable condition. And whereas if, if you had to plant a tiny little plant, you would have got more for your money instead of the one big spoiled brat of a plant. <laughs> and, uh, you, you would have brought diversity and those plants would have, uh, would have thrived. Just a small example of the planting. This is really only one or one or about one square meter. And there's the euphorbia, the uh, hellebore, the Corsican hellebore. There is fritillaries in there. There is uh, hepaticas and so on in there as well around the trough. And there is uh, this is Veronica Georgia blue. That that was all planted tightly together as small little pots. And it all could, could uh, compete with each other and create this little corner, which is something that you could only do if you had planned it well in advance. You couldn't push things back in here, just fill gaps or whatever, or create more diversity by putting another pattern. You have to think well in ahead, and you have to plant it and leave it and let it develop and have patience. Just some uh, sketches of how uh, the hard landscaping should be designed initially to bring in more uh, diversity. We should bring in rockeries, proper dry stone walls. They should be backfilled properly with rubble instead of uh, concrete, or now it's the big thing using uh, resin to glue your stones together. It's, it's terrible, I mean, the things people are coming up with. And, but we can pack all our rubble. When we're building walls, we end up with debris. And the debris can be, it has to be used for backfilling. This is a habitat for, uh, for lizards and for whatever, snails as well. That's a problem. OK, I admit, I admit on that one. But for planting and so on, it's great. I mean, there's one plant. I always love planting these dry stone walls. It's called a Seratostigma plumbagioides. And it's a herbaceous uh, plumbago or Seratostigma. And it grows, should I say, it dies back in, in winter and comes up quite late. And what I saw it in Tibet once, up in the top on the mountain above Lhasa, and it was growing out through all the cracks of the, the, the stone, out of the outcrops of stone. And so I realized that's exactly what it likes. So I throw them in the back of this wall, right down in the back, it disappears, fill it with soil, and uh, a year later it starts coming out through the gaps and it comes out with these little leaves that then uh, in uh, midsummer uh, you've, you've uh, an abundance of the deepest of, should I say, navy blue flowers and uh, foliage going into bright red. Couldn't be a better display. Um, and then you have areas in front of the wall, if it's south facing, all the better. And these little areas are great for time growing over. As a, uh, a contrast to this is the traditional way, and now uh, uh, for a kill rotary we are criticizing them. <laughs> no, is the, uh, the box hedging. Box hedging is actually a killer for diversity because the box hedging, it doesn't matter how small you keep it, but the root system actually goes well into the beds. And that's supposed to be a spade, should be chopped regularly uh, to, uh, to keep them back. It doesn't really harm the box. And curb stones is another thing that hold, or curb stones or fancy um, cobblestones along the bed also uh, should think differently about them. Just let the paths flow into it. There's always plants that will spread from the path, uh, from the, the beds into the path, and they just love that habitat, like the creeping time again. But we just like defining our contours. That's what apparently design is about, is, is definition. I do not agree. I'll run you through a few uh, gardens that we, we designed. And uh, this is one in, in, in Kilini. It's one large gardens and there's all these big hedges around it. A lot of them, Leylandia hedges and uh, laurel hedges and whatever. And 
Uh, so Jim, Jim approached me and asked me, would I design his garden? So you arrive at a garden like this, and you kind of immediately, as, as someone uh, designs, what do you not like about this garden? You just go through the various aspects and say, what's, what's not right about it? First thing, the curtains of the living room, they're all pulled. Uh, there's cars parking in front of the, uh, the, the doorway. And when you look out, all you see are cars. Huge lawn area, which is a lot of work and a waste of time. And, um, and the whole place looks like a travel lodge. So you knock on the door and you tell them all these things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I said, okay, I think this guy's right. And, and then you, you calculate how much time he actually spends on uh, doing the lawn. And I guessed so and so much. And it was three times the amount. So it's a huge amount, the hedges. And each, you know, you come back from work, and the first thing, oh, I have to cut the grass. I have to cut the hedges, you know. And you're doing this year for year, and there's no change. You know, it's still the same. And then you end up with moss in your, and daisies growing out of your grass. And you think, oh, God, how should we get rid of the daisies? You know, and it's, it's a mindset. And then this was another aspect. The houses, actually the garden's quite big, and, but the houses are kind of built on top of each other. This, this unusual house is looking straight in over him. So uh, we said we change all these aspects, and I'll show you the design. Is we decided to make a kind of an amphitheater, because Jim was going into retirement, so he wanted to really enjoy it. He wanted to become a gardener. And so we kind of said, well, gardening is about diversity. And so we uh, designed these, um, brought in this, this, this kind of an amphitheatre, trying to bring in as many habitats as possible. Oh yeah, we built a wall here out of the same red brick, simple measure, just to stop the cars from driving into this area. And this turns into a kind of a reception area. And cars that were pushed over the other side, and uh, people couldn't overlook. That way you end up with a courtyard setting, which again gives you uh, fantastic opportunities for growing certain things up against the walls. And uh, So the garden itself is really that you, uh, a pond in the centerpiece, and the pond is constantly overflowing. The water uh, from the roof goes into a cistern, and uh, there's a pump in the cistern, and it's pumping the water into the center of the pool. It flows over into the next little concentric circle, around, which is a reed bed, and the water is purified and then brought back into the system and then pumped back in. Uh, the whole area here is a gravel area, then uh, dry stone walls, of the first bed facing south, southeast, and well, more or less south. And so a lot of diversity we were thinking of putting in there. The next bed was one just to calm down everything. We planted one kind of grass, which is Calamacrostis, it's an upright grass. And uh, I decided to put a path, just an informal path going all the way through it. And Jim had an awful lot of diorama, the angel's fishing rod. And so we split up the diorama and put them all through the grasses. So he ends up with a meadow of diorama growing through the grasses, and then the grasses doing their own thing. The next part was an extension of the woodland, so we're planting all trees and shrubs to make it blend into the rest of the garden and the avenue of trees, which were actually quite nice. Uh, the Prunicerula and Isaac Rhizaeums, which was nice to work with. And, but the trees going in there were all very small. Just another cross-section of the garden from understanding. So that's, that's again, that's the cornfield, as I call it, and that's Jim running through it. <laughs> so we destroyed his garden in uh, January, and then started being very constructive and building old walls. It's all totally dry stone, no uh, mortar whatsoever, except for, the, obviously, the pond. We uh, brought in the, we actually ex extracted all the topsoil and subsoil, we mixed the two together and then brought them in uh, really loosely and just piled it in and let the frost uh, break it down and obviously it wasn't that frosty, well we had a few days but it wasn't really enough, we'd need minus 10 or so and then what you do after that 
uh, you plant Placidia, Tamacetifolia, which is great for the bees, and kept Jim happy for, uh, for till, well, until he couldn't see the blue anymore. <laughs> and so then, but what, what uh, Placidia does, it goes through the soil, and the root system is so fine, but it breaks it all up and covers it for, for it to settle naturally till we start planting in autumn. This is now the, the grass section, and this is the more diverse section. The rockery planting we left up to Jim to do himself. We planted a few things. The uh, gravel bed area that will be planted in a, in a should I say, in a indirect way by planting certain self-seeding plants in the in this bed, which will then seed into the gravel naturally and then grow. And then either you like it or you don't. Either you whip it out or you don't. And that, that was now basically when Jim opens his door, that's his view. He loved walls, and the whole thing worked very well. Planting started coming up quite quickly. You see the small trees and shrubs. I threw in a load of alliums as well. These are just measures to keep people, customers happy for the first year. And uh, they come up. The trouble with the allium is that uh, the Dutch uh, bulbs, a lot of them, they're grown to, uh, to volume so that they, you have nice large bulbs, but they don't, uh, they don't flower the next year. You probably got that a couple of times. So what you have to do is, and it's also a way of, different way of thinking, don't remove the seed heads. Let them sell seed, and uh, it'll take about three years, and then those seedlings will be big enough and flowering, and then you have good, a good allium stock. So that's the Calamagrostis, growing quite fast. Now th these pictures are taken probably, uh, I think, two years after planting, or a year and a half after planting. The Calamagrostis is first the grass, which is, goes nice and purple, and then it goes orange, and in winter it's uh, bleached white. It's attractive throughout the whole year. And then there you already see the new growth coming up, and either you cut it all down or you put a match to it, and uh, the, not only diversity of plants, but you bring in a diversity of fauna as well. Once you bring in so many different habitats, you end up with so many different uh, creatures growing, uh, living in the garden. And this is obviously of benefit to the whole ecosystem of our garden. We think we are too much control freaks when, it goes, when, when we're talking about gardens, and we try to, too hard to should I say, to be, uh, to, to be on top of everything and to govern everything. We can't, we want, we're dictators. We have to get down off that. We have to kind of let the other things dictate and the, the, the garden dictate. We can lead it in the right, subtly in the right direction, like we can even lead a dictator by not letting him know that you're dictating him. <laughs> Clever ways. But that's the way we have to implement certain things in the garden, and we have to have a bit more of an idea, but then we can let things happen. And we have to be a lot more open about how to do the, the wild <coughs> garden. It doesn't necessarily have to be wild, but it's just letting things balance together. So Jim was now a bit annoyed that he can't see his walls. <laughs> but the thing is, uh, as the season change, uh, you know, you, in spring you'll see his walls again when you, when you cut everything back. But the fact is now he feels totally private. So this garden, just for you, it's really, that would be about two, two and a half years after planting. <coughs> the pond, I'll just explain that again. You see the water coming up here in the center. It's really just a bubble. It's very supple. And it evenly fall, fall, uh, falls over the rim. There's another little lip we put in at a slate to allow it to flow over that. Just gives that special effect of a dribble all the way around. Uh, it's like, as Jim would say, a symphony of droplets. <laughs> and, uh, and this is the reed bed now coming up slowly. The idea is also that the walls are totally disguised. Uh, by summer and you've, uh, by irises and sedges.
and that's now in winter, and the little courtyard effect. Now, this isn't Jim's garden, but this is what Jim's garden should be like in the future. So we're looking at the mirror. This is actually up in the nursery, and the tall, long tree here that you see is the ginkgo, most the latest uh, colouring tree in, in the nursery, and it's just yeah, and it's just well. The ginkgo is probably about 120 years old now, and it's nice to enjoy it now. So we have to plan for our future generations. I'll run you through another little garden. Uh, this is the Alzheimer's Society down in uh, Black Rock, and I was approached to, to redesign it, or to basically uh, just uh, to, to bring in ideas. It was all voluntarily. So we, this was what we were left with of Alzheimer's Society is within the walled garden of the convent next door, and they donated to it. And it's, it's this modern square building, flat build, quite nice. And, but just the problem is you should never let an architect design your garden, because it ends up like this. And straight runs, uh, this kind of thing for wheelchairs, accessibility, but the fact that it's dominating the whole area, and it looks as if you're going down into a subway. Um, the pads here, they're, uh, they're wide enough for um, a carer to take two patients that have to walk on the grass because they can't, the, so it's only wide enough for the, for the carer to walk on. So it's just, and then the, the, the planting, obviously there wasn't much thought put into that, or they probably, they ran out of money. So, and you've this long bank going up to, so we just said we split up the areas, and so we brought in, broke up the areas, widened the paths, brought, made, turned, uh, brought our planting into it, brought a path going up to up the side to make this long slope accessible, brought in a pergola, again, pergolas are, very, are great for bringing in a diversity of different kinds of climbers, you would know if you're just filling your walls, that there's only a few climbers you put on it, but once you have a pergola, you can put so many different things on it at different levels and heights, and you can enjoy them so much more because they're growing up and the flowers are hanging down. This was done in collaboration with Dr. Mary Toomey. Uh, the planting here is just to give you an example of how close and diverse we can plant, mix things together, as long as there are plants where we can look through and there's a certain transparency, and the, the hogweed here, which is Sedinum lilichianum, uh, forms these kind of parachutes going through the trans, uh, translucent, <coughs> transparent planting. The catkins hanging down, that's uh, Sanguisorba uh, tenuifolia albiflora, stand-up comedian, you remember that name. That's why I'm not saying too many names, <laughs> because it ends up being just bad Latin names. And often when I have so many people in front of me, I forget them. <laughs> uh, the, border, the main border now, which was only lawn before, and works really well. And again, it was uh, a long border, there's a certain sense of repetition. They asked me then to do the sensory garden, and, which was great because they had a bit of money to do that. And so the sensory garden, it was this courtyard, and the courtyard was just paved. It was so ugly, you were looking at from the main windows where they're all sitting into just paved area and a bit of laurel planting over on the other side. The architect had brought in these walls, which are actually quite nice, are really nice because they've broken up the area. But uh, for me, the only thing I could think of putting in there and to make it accessible that people can walk all the way around. And, to again bring another feature in was the round water feature because I, I just happened to be making them at that time and so we decided to put in a round pond which is here change the courtyard and to allow people to sit close to the plants and to touch them as they, uh, as they sit there and then at the same time listening to the trickle of the water which is dribbling over. The whole thing is made out of concrete. Quite simple. I mean, it was obviously the budget was tight, but works really well. You can imagine sitting there just glaring at the reflection in the water all day. 
And I think it's so much, it's so important that we think a little bit more what we do in these kind of places, because we can all end up in them. And, and now we're, we're all sane and we have the money maybe to do something, we should be doing things. And we should be, I mean, now things are booming again, we should be thinking and in, in investing in those areas and not in whatever they're going to be investing in. I mean, if you think of going, to, I mean, who would want to go to Tala Hospital? I mean, come on. <laughs> Anyhow, another quick line. I was approached by a field uh, in the middle, uh, in Carlo, in the middle of a cornfield, uh, a, a slightly converted cottage. <laughs> well, yeah, that was the original cottage. <laughs> but it's it's beautiful conversion and addition to it. A very large house, and it's always it's a house which isn't. Uh, people aren't really living in it at the moment. They're just going there for the odd weekend and hope to reside there in a later stage. So it was to fill these planting areas. Now the design uh, um, is not, uh, it wasn't mine. I was just asked to do the planting. So it's always interesting to do, to complement someone else's design with my planting. But I, uh, you see certain aspects that I wouldn't have done if you hadn't listened to me earlier on. Uh, the pads, obviously, I wouldn't define my pads in such a way. I actually like keeping my pads within a garden as soft as possible because gardens change, especially small gardens. A tree suddenly dominates where a path was. So what do you do? Cut the tree away just because you have, have your design? Or do you softly have the path going around the tree? So once we've worked more with soft landscaping, uh, we're saving an awful lot of money. We can spend more money on plants. And, um, and, uh, and, and uh, we're more creative as the garden matures. So there's certain aspects here which are very effective, but, and uh, it was fun to plant. So you have uh, the shady areas, the courtyard on the one side, the shady side, and the sunny side. <coughs> Uh, the whole planting was supposed to reflect the cornfields and the general atmosphere within the open space and uh, the, the exposure that was enjoyed uh, in, in this area. Now the thing that here, you can see that the unusual shape of the garden, although it's in, in the middle of nowhere, why have a shape like that? It's just purely out of a, a practical agricultural reasons that the farmer cutting a... a um, Farming the land with its large machinery can sweep up that way and then sweep down the other. It's much easier to sweep up a triangle than go around corners of a square. You end up with too much so-called headland, wasteland. So that was the idea of that. But uh, you have to, if you're sitting there and you're constantly looking down through this, uh, your eye, you, you, start, you start getting a funnel effect. So the idea was really to bring two so-called planting peninsulas out uh, that nearly meet each other within this area that are offset from each other. But again, there's certain areas like the raised beds and so on where we can work with really drought resistant, interesting plants that love that kind of condition of uh, being totally exposed. So the planting around there started to develop quite well, and it's kind of the prairie planting, and it's just a joy to go through it. So that's now uh, the view looking up through the garden. You have these two planting uh, schemes interlocking. They're, they're re repetitions of each other, kind of five years ago. In Germany, I was working in Germany, living in Germany. And uh, the German landscape, obviously, the Germans are very industrious. So they need space for their industry. And it, the industry is often in the most beautiful valleys, squashed in between. And uh, this is in a very, very picturesque landscape with a large river wind meandering through. Uh, but the, obviously the, the, the industrial landscape is an eyesore. This guy, uh, an inventor, he decided he wants to live right beside his factory. And the other brief was he doesn't want to see anything around him. And he doesn't, uh, and he wants to feel like Indiana Jones. Okay. <laughs> so, that was the brief. Um, I said it will take a bit of time, but we'll, we'll get there. So the garden after 20 years just turned into this. First, you can imagine it. I don't have any pictures of the beginning. It would have all been very prairie style. The prairie style, and 
then planted with certain trees and shrubs, special things all the way around, which I then, in a phase 15 years later, would have pruned out and I would have selected certain ones I don't want. Uh, the prairie planting started being pushed out only into those areas where there was enough light for it, but it became less and less. Whereas when I planted the trees and shrubs, I would have planted certain shade-loving plants around the base of the trees and shrubs, uh, which would then uh, multiply and wander as the shade develops within the, uh, and as the trees grow. Around the perimeter, he would have, uh, he, that was his idea, to to heap up this bank of soil all the way around. So it looked very artificial. And that was the first thing I planted up with more kind of hedging, trees and shrubs, and punctuated with certain special things. But that uh, uh, mound all the way around, I asked him to walk through that and to keep a path on top and to maintain with his secateurs, constantly cut any branch that's in his way. That way he ended up with his tunnel going all the way around his garden, which ended up like a uh, like, um, oh, how should I say? Yeah, w uh, in, 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 in an old church or so, what do you call it? The, the <laughs> yeah, the cloister. And then he ended up cutting views into his garden. And it ended up being a really nice feature. <coughs> a natural swimming pool, which kept going really well. The kids grew up. Uh, living with snakes, with long snakes, and the grandchildren come into the living room with a nice long snake <laughs> holding it. The bamboo I planted, which was only that size, uh, now developed to one of the largest ones in, in that area. Uh, the stems are about that thick. And the local people from the village, they come and uh, harvest it for flagpoles when they're doing their marches. And but it's a nice example of how a bamboo should be grown and not contained in a small area. Because that way it turns into a totally different kind of uh, um, plant, which is then a bamboo grove, and you end up with views through all these verticals. The interesting thing, this one reverted. It was uh, Philostachus aureus vulcaulus, uh, Vivax aureus vulcaulus, which is a very good band of Irish conditions, incredibly good. And it reverted into uh, uh, an, a different form, which is uh, Philostephus Huang Wang Shu. This is the atmosphere you get. This is his pathway going around. And you end up with these areas that you can plant up so prettily with woodland plants. His view is looking out into the garden. And as the garden develops, you see a lot of the shade loving plants just taking over and covering the ground and uh, reducing maintenance like this would be epimedium, over here would be wild steinia. Some of the grass is still, miscanth is still coming through. The ones too deep in the shade, they wouldn't be flowering. And a lot was on autumn color. One of the areas, the shade loving areas, just to show you how many different shade loving plants you can pack together. This is actually up in Manfield's nursery. And we have to think in all the different layers of planting. So you have the tall trees, uh, medium sized trees, shrubs, uh, perennials, taller perennials, and uh, lower perennials. And we can plant so many plants on top of each other. Again, as long as we don't feed them too much. So I'll run through. And as every garden develops, trees and shrubs get a bit taller, bigger, and take up more space. You'll see that in Kil Kilruddery, they thought well ahead, they knew that their trees are going to get big, so they became part of the picture and the overall management, and how important it is to have a long-term head gardener who sticks with the place and not a quick fix will get your man. That doesn't work. It has to be someone who grows up with the place and, and identifies himself with the place. I mean, think of gardens like Mount Usher. I mean, it would have never been a place as it is if there hadn't have been head gardeners there that have spent more or less their whole lives dedicated to the work they've done there. This is a small area just in Mount Venus Nursery, one tiny little corner that we like so much. It's just in front of our uh, kind of cafe. And we don't serve coffee, though. You have to make it yourself. <laughs> but it's just a very simple 
uh, bench that I once designed for a show garden. There's no actual legs, well, there's legs attached to it, but it allows for planting directly underneath it and around it with stone suspended on steel. And uh, the, the Japanese maples tumbling over, and you just sit there on the smallest space. So, I mean, for these gardens, just to, that's why I'm bringing this in, you don't need big gardens. You can reduce all these ideas on a minimum of space. But obviously, if you have the space, the trees will get broader, bigger, and like here, Mount Usher, fantastic collection of all these trees, beautifully maintained, and the problem is if we choose the wrong tree. This tree here is a uh, Phagus sylvatica subtilensis, which uh, is in, um, in in Hanover, and it layers. It doesn't really layer, it just lays down and then grows up again. It doesn't really root here, but it's covered an area the size of a football pitch. It's like a triplet. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So, just to show you that, on the long run, we're, we're, the diversity is going to become less and less because uh, uh, certain trees are going to dominate and that a lot of thought has to be put into which trees we're planting. We're planting an awful lot of birch trees in our gardens. It's a big mistake. Birch trees are big trees. They will grow big, they're fast growing, and their root system is very, very horizontal and will push up any of the Indian sandstone or whatever is in the garden and destroy the garden to a certain extent. But it also uh, it doesn't allow for too much, too many other planting in between. So there's the, uh, the, the fagus, and now they put a walkway underneath it, <laughs> and it's actually growing well over it, and it becomes a huge And the best thing, I mean, as long as it's still available, uh, is cat litter from Lidl. Okay. And uh, it's a clay mineral called uh, Fuller's Earth, or uh, bentonite, more scientifically, or monolite. And it's a clay mineral which come, uh, it derives from uh, volcanic uh, origin more. And uh, it is high in minerals, really high. It has the capacity to hold about 80 times its own weight in moisture. Obviously, that's what it does as cat litter, which is a waste. It's a total waste using it for, for uh, having cats piling in it. Um, I go down, I buy five bags and bags of it because it's only 260. And the great thing is, Ali does the same thing, and the two compete with each other. And it was 290, and now it's gone down to 260. And the, uh, the amounts we use uh, putting through our compost uh, uh, makes a difference. But they do, you do get weird looks, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly, it's big cash. <laughs> And it breaks down. Yeah. It doesn't break down like loam. If you got loam into your, if you have sandy soil and you bring in loam, the problem is loam will bind your sandy soil and turn it into more kind of a really hard rust. If you bring in bentonite, for example, bentonite always or uh, cat litter, uh, it stays as a, a. How should I say? It doesn't break down. It doesn't smudge up. It does go smudgy, but it stays within its own kind of conglomeration and formed. It's, it's just a very good good material, even if you're doing a lot of pot gardening in pots and uh, planters and so on, to mix it in with your uh, your compost. You don't have shares in cat litter. I don't have shares in little <laughs> or cat litter or anything, so I, I'm thinking of rebounding yes, so it. Not 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 <laughs> so, and then there's certain other products, I'm just trying out something someone dropped it in, is uh, ground, certain um, ground mineral rocks which you get in bags. And that just brings, brings up the mineral content within your garden. What about cocoa shell? That was another one that we used to be around. Cocoa shell is a, is a mulch, it's used as a mulch. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it brings in certain goodness to the soil. But the trouble often about using mulch is, is again, you're the same effect as the manure on top, that you're creating this artificial kind of um, cover over the planting, 
which is only of value to certain plants, woodland plants and that kind of thing, they thrive under that because they enjoy the litter falling off, well, the leaves falling off the trees, accumulating and turning into uh, humans. And so they, they actually enjoy that kind of thing. But uh, for a lot of the exposed planting, or it's often not so good to mulch. I'm, I've, come, I've come off the idea of mulching to a certain extent, yeah. I mean, we can go on further. I'd be talking about maintenance, how to maintain these areas, and whatever. You know, but you end up, yeah, losing it. There's so much to talk about. But, um, I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Sorry? What's your thoughts on algae gardening? Well, we were brought up that way to not to dig, yeah. not to plow. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I mean, if you're. Uh, Obviously, if you've got a compacted garden with, mm -hmm. and dreadful conditions, you have to do something about it, and that's what I was saying. The deeper down you can go and break it up, the better. You don't necessarily have to turn the, turn the soil. That's not, not ideal. But to actually break it up. I mean, no dig. I mean, what he will probably be talking about is a, is a tool, I'm sure you've mentioned it, but we always use that in Germany. It's called a Zautzahn. <coughs> Zautzahn is is a, a sow's tooth, which is a tool which looks like a plow, and you, you have it on a stick, and you pull it through the soil, so, and there's a, a kind of a, an arrow head at the bottom of it, and you pull it through, and that goes down deep through the soil and breaks it up, without moving the soil. The other thing is about maintenance is that we disturb the soil as little as possible, because the more you disturb it, the more you're exposing uh, sub layers to the sun, which then uh, allow for allow the, the, the seeds that are dormant in there to germinate. So you end up creating more of a seed problem. So we tend to be very cautious when we're doing maintenance or uh, weeding. It's really to stick in with a fork or something or something uh, that would go down deep to loosen the soil and then pull out the weed. And I think to get your garden no dig, it's a series of years, isn't it? To, to, to yeah. get to the point where you can actually no, no dig yeah. again. And then it depends what you're doing. I mean, the no dig thing is probably for vegetables, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah, so vegetable gardening is a totally different kind of gardening to, uh, to the kind of gardening that we're doing. Yeah. You're, you're looking for yields, you're looking for good vegetables. Mm -hmm. <laughs>